I did just want to mention briefly, you know, in 2016, uh, before we started the Data Creation Network, the whole idea of this project was really born out of a conference just like this um, with about three other colleagues of mine, one of them is sitting right there, uh, over margaritas at a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> so the fact that we're going to a Mexican restaurant tonight, I think is gonna really bode well, and and I think margaritas is the key to success in all of data curation. <laughs> um, so uh, again, uh, I was just pointing my colleague, uh, Cynthia Hassan Vitali, uh, we're here to represent uh, a much larger group of people that I will actually show you uh, some, some images and names of in a minute, so I won't list them all. Uh, but we have been working on this project for uh, those many years and I have a lot of uh, stories to tell. But first, let's just revisit that why question and I really don't think I need to go into too much detail here. Um, but our stance is, is quite a practical one and, and that's really just through our experience of, of working with researchers that are needing to share their data beyond its original purpose. So we're working at repositories, uh, both institutional repositories, but also a general data repository. And the data that we see and that come to us are not always in their best shape. Uh, so they are messy, they may lack context, uh, they are in file formats that are always at risk, and uh, sometimes they just are left uh, for, for many years and just neglected, so we need to revive them. Just to give you a little evidence behind that statement, which I, uh, I think all of you can relate to, uh, we did do a study, uh, I believe this was back in 2017, of uh, just a six month period of data sets that came through our repositories, and 47% of them had no documentation at all. So really just the file itself was the one being published, or the one that was being uh, deposited into the repository. So if left alone, they, uh, would have no documentation without any curatorial interaction. Um, we also uh, did a number of focus groups uh, where we talked to researchers. We asked them what curation activities are important to you. Uh, what are the things that, that really need to happen for you and your data? Uh, and not surprisingly, there were, most of the data curation activities that we posed to them, there were 47 in total, um, were important. Uh, they were, they, you know, researchers recognized those things as important. Um, unfortunately though, the, the most important activities uh, for research data were not always happening. So we, we held those focus groups and we asked them, does this actually happen for your data? Uh, and there were a number of very important things that did not happen. And, and so we saw this as an opportunity for really improving in the lives of researchers to really interject some of these uh, activities and, and processes uh, into areas that might not just be occurring at all. The other question we asked them, uh, okay, so if it is happening for your data, are you satisfied? And there again, we see an opportunity because a lot of the very important activities were not happening in satisfactory ways. So researchers might be creating documentation, but they're just not really happy with the results, they're not really understanding what to do to make it better, um, or they really did not see a path forward towards quality assurance of their data, or other, um, other skills and, and procedures that us in the data curation community could provide. So uh, we saw a clear opportunity there uh, for those of us who, who were working with researchers and in the repository land uh, to really shift from skills and activities that we thought were important as archivists and as librarians toward skills and activities that our researchers really thought were important. And that is what the data curation really was, was based on. Um, so this is what, how we're defining uh, uh, data curation, and uh, these are some of the, the steps that we take. Um, so when we're, we're working with a data set, we, you know, data curation activities include finding and adding missing files, creating additional documentation, screening for privacy and disclosure risk, not just trusting that somebody checked the box to say there's no personal identifiable information, actually testing that theory out. Uh, detecting and fixing code issues, quality assurance issues in the code, whether or not it will run in, in our environment versus their computer. Um, transforming those files for long-term access, making decisions about what does that transformation 
actually do to the file? Does it impact the data in any way? Does it impact the usability in any way? Um, arranging and describing the files to provide a context to, to really showcase the information that is there, to, to publish the data that looks presentable and, and useful. Uh, and then reviewing and augmenting metadata. And I intentionally put that last because I feel like there's, of course, a lot of really uh, great <laughs> metadata standards out there. Um, but we in, in multidisciplinary repositories, we, we can't focus just on the metadata standards because we're dealing with all different types of data. So sometimes the, the metadata augmentation is a little uh, maybe superficial or just cleaning up that metadata a little bit just to ensure interoperability with the rest of the data sets in our collections. We're not just doing this for ourselves. Uh, we obviously have to look at the bigger picture. Um, so curators aren't just you know, hoarding data and ah, this is great data. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can never replicate that laugh again in my life, by the way. That's really weird. Um, <laughs> but we are underlying uh, a much larger mission here, and, and that is to, of course, support the repositories that we work for, uh, that are they're providing the technical capacities to publish these data sets to make them findable, to make them discoverable. So there, you know, of course, there's a lot of infrastructure in place to, to expose all the metadata and, and to broker that metadata to a lot of really great sources. Um, and they are supporting researchers who are not only our, our depositors, but also our users of data. So the, the researchers, uh, there, there's a credibility issue that repositories have to really interact with researchers and ensure that we are making sure that their data is trustworthy and fair. Um, and then, of course, the public, that broader access piece that we are ensuring that the, anybody can, can potentially gain access to data. It might not be open all the time. Maybe there's a process to go through. Maybe there are certain conditions you have to meet first. Um, but we're, we're serving that broader, broader community. Um, serving that broader community is fraught with many challenges. Uh, so again, pulling from some research that we've done, uh, we did a study of Association of Research Library Institutions and asked them, what are the barriers to providing data curation services? And, and the number one barrier, and, and all of them were barriers, by the way, but they were all considered very challenging or mostly challenging, at least you know, for the majority of our participants here. Um, but expertise <laughs> in curating domain data was one of the major challenges, the most uh, challenging. And then, of course, scaling with increased demand. And, and these are uh, very common issues, I think, that the Data Curation Network in particular has been trying to uh, better understand in order for us to tackle. So with that, I will turn over to what we are actually doing. Um, so the Data Curation Network is a, uh, right now, we're, we're a grant-funded project. We're funded by the Alpha P. Sloan Foundation. And we are a community of uh, librarians, of repository managers, of administrators in academic organizations that are really trying to come together and ensure that researchers can share their data in ways that are ethical and, and very usable, reusable. Um, right now, we have 10 partner institutions. These are all uh, US-based institutions. And um, nine of them are academic universities. Uh, they are uh, pretty homogeneous in the sense that they are large, uh, well-funded academic research institutions. Uh, we also have Dryad, which is the, the uh, general data repository that Aaron uh, worked for. We're gonna be really sad that because maybe there's in there. Maybe I won't have to. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this group has uh, been uh, coming together to, to really share expertise. And I guess this is the main point I wanna give everybody to take away. Um, we, we're not just a, a best practices community, although we definitely talk about best practices, but functionally, um, we curate each other's data. Each one of the people on this screen have uh, a different expertise. They um, have you know, PhDs in different domains and disciplines. They have uh, amazing skill sets in different software and programming languages. And when I receive a data set that comes to my repository uh, that is a chemical spectra file or is an R file, um, I personally cannot curate that data set as well as somebody else in our network who has that skill set and that expertise. So right now we've got 28 data curators that cover 46 
or 43 domains and 26 specialty file types. Um, the history here, uh, we started the planning phase in uh, 2016, as I mentioned, Margarita's. Um, the, uh, the planning phase, that included some of that research where we interviewed all of our uh, focus group researchers about their needs, and then we published this model, and, and the Data Curation Network model is a very uh, theoretical framework for how would we do this, um, and, and I'm happy to say today we're actually implementing that model. Um, so with uh, another funding phase from the Sloan Foundation to do the implementation phase, we actually went live uh, in January 1st of this year. So we've been curating each other's data sets uh, since that time after you know months and uh, well, years, I guess, of, of planning and training. Uh, we, we do annual trainings for all of our curators. Um, we put a system in place to track all of the data sets that go through the network and to monitor time tracking and all that. So, so that is all in place and we are growing. Um, each, at each one of these steps, we've been incrementally and intentionally uh, adding new members to really try to expand and to test that, that relationship, really, because it's pretty easy to you know, get a group of you know, your, your close buddies and, and say, let's do this together, but to really scale, to really expand and, and to build up that, um, that group, and, and it, it's, it's quite, uh, quite fascinating. So for the rest of the talk, uh, and I have no idea how long I'm talking, but hopefully someone will flag me down, uh, is, uh, thank you, <laughs> um, it's really going to focus on our vision. And, and we, we did a pretty extensive visioning process to identify what do we want to be, um, uh, you know, how, how do we want to really grow this, this project. So for each one of these areas, um, we, we have a, a vision for what we want to do under each of those particular areas. And, and so I'll just spend a little bit of time uh, describing each of those. So the first is, of course, data curation. This is the doing. Um, this is the actual curation work that we do for one another uh, because we feel that having you know, a broad set of expert curators to curate our data is just going to, we are going to be able to curate data better by relying on each other. And in fact, I could never hire all the experts that I would need for my institution. So this is really the only way we're going to be able to do it. Um, one of the things that we use uh, in our training and in our work are these curate steps. So this is something that the, the group created early on when we analyzed all of the different uh, important data curation activities that researchers wanted. But we also needed a baseline. We needed to know what's the minimum steps that everybody needs to take if you're curating something to our data curation network standards. And this is what we use in our training program. Uh, for which Cynthia and I gave a, a two and a half hour version of earlier today, um, where we really uh, walk people through uh, sort of the, this, this step because it, it, we need to have a normal, normalized process where we can all kind of rely on one another to be doing the same things, at least at this very basic level. And, and this is our process overall. Um, and, and one thing I want to say about the, the, the process here, so this first layer is the, the local institutional layer. And, and we did a number of pilots early on in the data curation network, and we found that the local institution really needs to retain a lot of control over what happens to the data. Uh, we don't want the data curation network to be interfering or interjecting itself into anything policy related, and actually not too much related to infrastructure and technology as well. We wanted the data curation network to be the human layer in your data repository service. So in this instance, we've got um, data that's coming into the local institution, and they make the decisions about ingest, they make the decisions about appraisal, about selection, um, and then they are also responsible for facilitating access to long-term storage preservation. So they're doing a lot of those repository functions. Uh, the other important thing to note here is that the data curation network is technology agnostic. So we really want to work, and we do work, with any technology platform because those platforms will come and go. Uh, they are decided based on a lot of decisions, not just is this the best fit for me, but maybe this is the right thing for us because we develop in this language. So we, we needed to kind of stay below that layer. And below that layer, let's go, um, is the data curation network. And this is our uh, coordination process. So the, we have a coordinator position in the DCN. 
who reviews all incoming data sets that have been selected for submitting to the DCN. And I should mention, not all data sets from a local institution come down to us. They might have the local capacity to curate or something else. Um, but when they do, we review them for uh, the domain and the file type, and we assign it to the appropriate person in the network, depending on their availability, which is another consideration and difficult to track. Um, they go through those curate steps that I mentioned earlier, uh, where they are checking the files, understanding the file types, and they're applying a lot of uh, domain-based uh, decisions around the actual file type itself. So these, these check steps and these, uh, these curate steps actually take place um, in a different way depending on the data that comes in. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a second. Um, once they're complete, they reply, uh, they send the data set back, they send the, or the assignment back to the coordinator and say, here's what I'd recommend. Here are all the steps that I would take uh, to ensure that this data is reusable and, and fair. Um, then that is passed back to the local curator. And I'm, I'm going through that rigorous process with you today because I want to just make the point that we didn't want to remove the local connection between the curator and the researcher. Because that is something that we at each of our institutions value. We really see that as a great opportunity to create a relationship with those local authors and ensure that those connections stay strong. So we didn't want somebody else from Michigan interfering in our process. So, so by doing it this way, um, we've really been able to protect uh, those relationships, and I think it's been working really well. Um, the, uh, the final step is, is to really ensure that we are evaluating that overall process. Um, so we have weekly stand-ups where the curators come together and talk about you know, this is what I did for this actual curation. Like, I received a report, and here's what I, I took back to the researcher, and here's what they actually did. Um, and so that's really kind of the most exciting point in the process where you can see the impact of our work and you can see that final result uh, come to fruition. The tools we use, um, so I mentioned uh, the, the data sets come in. They come in to us via JIRA. We're using JIRA software as our time tracking software management tool. Um, and, and that's been working really well for us. We, we pretty much highly customized it, I think I would say, uh, for all of the, the ingest forms and, and you know, how it walks through the, the Kanban board of all the processes and the information that we're collecting. Um, we also uh, use WordPress for our website where we are really promoting all the data sets that come through our network and talking about the curation steps that have happened. That's really a part of our role for trying to advocate for this should not just be a hidden process. This is something that, that we want to share and make known. Uh, and then we build community through our, our Slack channels and our uh, listserv. And our curators are, are also talking about you know, best practices and, and really trying to you know, share new ideas or new, new examples that they come across. Um, so we've been doing this for about six months now. And uh, this just gives you uh, kind of a confusing example, but I'll try to walk through it. Um, in yellow, uh, these are the submitted data sets per type. And then in, in blue, these are our experts. So, so eventually, one day, you know, the, uh, the yellow is going to far outstrip the blue because our experts are kind of, you know, going to remain a little static, but the, the number of data sets are going to keep going up. So I don't know how long I can use this slide, but at least it gives you an idea of where you know the the types of data coming in you know are, are aligning with our, our skill sets or you know maybe where there is a, a, a missing area I don't know what that other is actually I should look it up um, but we've only curated about 50 58 so far uh, and and we're working on processes to make it easier for institutions to set something to the education network because there is there is a time lag involved. You are sending it to another person. There is a communication time lag of actually getting the assignment accepted by the curator. Um, the turnaround times, I've got another slide here on turnaround times. But we try to um, make assignments uh, successful within 24 hours. So we'll ping the curator and say, can you do this? And, and hope to get an answer back within 24 hours to keep that process going. Um, the median turnaround time, so the completion for one of our curators is about three days. Each data set, um, the curation time for the curator is about 2.5 hours. I think that's what we're averaging right now. Um, but that turnaround time, of course, is going to be longer. 
Um, and then everybody is reaching, uh, you know, in their due dates, but I wanted to just point out that if you have a due date that's further out, you'll see our curators are waiting until that due date to finish it. <laughs> so lesson learned here, <laughs> keep your due date short. Um, but that's not always possible either, because <laughs> if you make it too short, then we wouldn't be able to get it back to you, as we know with the dry. <laughs> um, then I mentioned the website, and, and this is something we've been experimenting with a, a, a lot, and I'd really love to hear from the community about this. We want to make the curation process a little bit more transparent, but it's hard because we don't want to throw the researchers under the bus. So we don't want to spell out, eh, this data set was horrible, and you can't believe all the things we had to do to it. Um, but we also you know, want to say, wait, we did do stuff to it. Uh, so we're experimenting with just having kind of the generic curation services that were done for each individual data set kind of listed um, without going into too many specifics, and then you can link to the final result. Um, and then something else we're really, really interested in is highlighting the role of the individual curator. Um, really uh, celebrating the professional aspects of this is a person who is, is entered into this field and, and has an amazing set of skills uh, that you're not going to find anywhere else. And, and we need to ensure that we're giving all of the, the carrots, I guess was mentioned earlier, for these, these individuals to, um, to continue to participate in this profession. So that idea of how do we recognize, how do we celebrate, how do we um, increase the professionality of the, of the data curation uh, as, as, a, as a job, as a role. All right, and this is one way we're also doing that. Oh, that's such a good segue. Um, so one of the things the Data Curation Network has been doing uh, for the last two years is uh, offering workshops beyond our own group. So, so we've got 28 curators, we've trained them all in, everything's going great. How can we make sure that other people are also uh, you know, getting access to some of this information? Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is through the Specialized Data Curation Workshops. So Cynthia hudson Vitali is the PI of this particular grant, and uh, this is a program funded through the IMLS, uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services in the United States. Um, and we've taught two workshops, technically three workshops so far, uh, we did one before the grant started, um, to bring together the community, and is that really a juice <laughs> <laughs> Several people in the room have actually come to these workshops. Um, but it's been a great opportunity to, uh, again, come together and collaborate and, and better understand how we can increase the, uh, the abilities for us as a community to curate data more efficiently. Uh, these are just the learning outcomes. You'll see an emphasis here on building up network and building community. And, and that's certainly something that we've been doing um, through our primer time, our primer uh, outputs for these workshops. So this is just a, an example from the last one of the, the way that the two days is broken down. So it's a day and a half. Uh, it's a very hands-on event. Um, we have uh, the check steps that we go through. So we do a little bit of lecture on every uh, step in the curation process, including uh, the, the, the uh, curated steps. So D is the document step there at the end. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Um, and then we have uh, five different data sets that we've been working with. Uh, so the, the uh, room actually groups up around one of these particular data types, and each data type produces its own set of challenges. And the group working from the, 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 the curious steps and the checklist really goes into much more specific details about how you would treat you know, the survey data differently than you would the tabular data. Um, and this is just a few of the examples of, of the data sets that we, we review. Um, there we go, lots of great examples. Okay, uh, so far we've had two, as I mentioned. Um, so workshop number one was last year, it was a year ago uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Um, we've been, uh, we have an application process. Uh, we've been receiving about 50 applicants per session, uh, but we only have funding for 25 uh, attendees for each session, so we've been having to cap that off. Um, we've got a, another workshop coming up in a couple weeks, and the outcomes of each of these workshops are listed here, and I'll share out what these are. Um, this has been the most exciting thing, I think, for us, is to really see 
the data curation resources coming out of these trainings. So we're not just training people, we're actually mining them for information and positioning them to publish everything that they know, because actually our community knows a lot about all of the different data types. So the, the, one of the greatest examples I think of our outputs has been these primers. So data curation primers, it's a concise, actionable resource meant to assist data curation adding value to a data set. Um, we've got them uh, loaded into GitHub, and uh, each one is a, uh, it, it's created from attendees that come to the workshop. They uh, get together in groups at the session. So we'll actually have everybody pitch uh, a primer. And then the primers that get a lot of, you know, plus ones uh, will actually uh, be minted into a group. Um, each one of those groups is assigned a mentor. One of the, uh, the co-PIs on the grant is a mentor because we're going to ask them to meet monthly over a six-month period to actually write and develop the primer. So there's a, there's a fair bit of research that goes into these. There's a fair bit of experience that goes into these. Um, we also have stipends if people want to interview researchers to really add the, the, the value to the data set or to the, um, to the primer. They are peer-reviewed. Uh, by our community and then published to GitHub and uh, archived in, in the institution repository. Um, the peer review process has been really fun. Uh, we've actually tried to expand it recently to people even beyond uh, the network, but really getting feedback from the community, is this useful? We don't want a, a manual on you know what an SPSS file is. There's a manual out there on, on the, the file itself. What we want is how do I treat an SPSS file if I'm curating it? What do I need to look for? What are the properties about this particular file that I'm gonna to need to pull out or that I'm gonna to need to understand in order to ensure that it's usable? And it's gonna be different for every data type that we encounter. So uh, this these are published on GitHub, as I mentioned, and I just wanted to show an example from a few. Um, so uh, we've got one on SPSS files, as I kept mentioning. Uh, and here are some of those suggestions in, in the, from the primer itself. So with the SPSS file, you're, you could save it as a .por, and it's a question mark. So <laughs> there's a conversation there. Um, and I'm trying to remember if there were other, I think, oh, these notes were coming out of the actual webinar that our primer authors had presented. So this was actually part of the discussion. Um, we also have one on Microsoft Access. This is a common data type that I see in our repository. Of course, there's some proprietary concerns there, and uh, there's a lot of questions about how do you actually demonstrate the relationships uh, of a proprietary database format. And then uh, Microsoft Excel is a really uh, kind of core example. Um, there's a lot of conversation, I think, happening in that primer about whether or not you are doing some of the tidying up of the data. Well, are you making that data set rectangular? Is it okay to leave it you know, in a poor quality or not? Jupyter Notebooks, uh, this is a, a really great example that code is data as well. Code needs curation. Um, so how you treat code differently uh, is explored in this particular primer. And here are some ad additional topics that are being worked on as we speak. Uh, we're hoping to publish these in January. And uh, so far, it's just been a really great opportunity uh, to provide this platform for uh, those of us, you know, all of the experts in our community who, who have these skills and subject knowledge to um, really present that back out in, in a way that can be cited, in a way that is recognized. And we encourage others to get on board. So definitely contact us if you're interested. We've got uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, the next topic I wanted to just briefly explore is uh, some of the research that we've been doing in the Data Creation Network. Uh, I think it's it's always been our intention um, to really explore this space to see does does data curation make a difference. Um, I think that's kind of the one of the core questions that we we wrote into our program. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, we've been exploring kind of the importance of data, data curation, the importance of the activities, and I think we've seen a really positive response to that, but does it make a difference? Does the, the time and the effort and the people and the staff and the technology involved um, make a difference? It's time out. <laughs> so I'll just keep going. Um, the value of curation is a very difficult topic to address. 
no two data sets are the same. So it's really hard to put them in an experimental environment and curate one and not the other and to see which one gets used more or to see which one is more useful. Um, but we've been trying to uh, assess a number of different methodologies to help us figure out how can we, how can we really approach this question um, in an empirical way and, and get to the heart of this. And one, I, um, one possible approach that we're, we're really exploring right now is how to validate um, the metadata. So looking at the metadata of a particular data set, can we say that the metadata is more complete or less complete? What is our uh, standard for completeness? So that's kind of where we've been focusing some time and attention to and, and want to engage the community about. And then in the future, how are we uh, really positioning data curation services within the broader suite of research data management? I know many uh, in the room here when we, we had our workshop are RDM librarians, RDM service providers. Data curation is a piece of that RDM puzzle, um, but what does that look like in relation to the rest of our services? Thank you. Uh, the, the next thing I'm going to talk about is just our sustainability plan. So I, I think this is a, a real world of interest to the group here because it's a very difficult question. As I mentioned, you can get a group of your uh, closest colleagues in a room together and come up with a plan and all stick to it. But as you keep growing and you keep expanding, you lose that, that initial sense of community and you become a new type of community. And, and how to grow that has been a real challenge for us. or how to how to anticipate that growth, I think, has been a challenge for us because we're not, we're not growing too fast yet. Um, so this has been our, our, our plan up until now. So we, we are uh, in our implementation phase. We're uh, in year two of a three-year grant. Um, and we have onboarded two new partners this year, as we intended to, uh, because we really had intended to grow inc incrementally, adding on uh, a few partners at a time particularly thinking about where are our gaps in expertise versus the, the data sets that we're curating. Um, but then we, we hope to transition to something else uh, once the grant is complete. We want to be able to grow and, and sustain this project and, and ensure that others can gain access to these types of services. Uh, the question, of course, is how? Um, we are trying to answer that question in a number of ways. Uh, we, we had a, a sustainability panel um, or an advisory panel at, at our 2019 All Hands meeting. Um, and some of you might recognize one of them, hopefully, um, or if not all, um, where uh, we really wanted to hear back from other experts in the field who've been doing this and who've been thinking about these things uh, to help us understand are we on the right track? And, and what should we be thinking about? And it was really interesting to get the perspective, the outside perspectives uh, for us because we we'd always sort of felt like we just need to keep growing in order to be successful. But maybe success isn't just keeps growing. Maybe success is we get better at what we do with what we've got. So it really challenged us to think differently about how we are measuring our success. Um, the other thing we have done is uh, through an RFP process, we've uh, hired a consultant, uh, the Lyricist Group, to work with us to understand a variety of uh, administrative structures and, and models that might be appropriate for this type of work. Uh, and I mention that because there's, there's some evidence to show through our focus groups and through our, our, consult, our discussions with other projects like this that the membership model, at least in the United States context, how it can be uh, fatiguing, and, and institutions aren't necessarily interested in paying $5,000 or $10,000 every year after year after year. So are there other models that we should be looking at to really approach this in a way that will position us for success? Um, one of those models is, is a hybrid, and this is something that our group has been discussing for a couple of years now. Um, and something we're actually kind of putting into practice as we speak because each of us is an uh, institution that is providing in-kind contribution. So if I put in, you know, through my team, we put in 20 hours in the month of, of August. Um, does that mean that we get 20 hours back of curation time from everybody else? Uh, does that mean that our membership fee goes down by whatever that 20 hours might equal in dollars? Um, so really thinking about how can you uh, create a, an economy around uh, expertise and, and the, the value add that the curators are providing. Um, the other thing we're talking about is, is providing data curation uh, to end users as a fee-for-service model. 
Uh, this is something that you know might be uh, of interest to institutions that don't have a data curator, who won't ever have a data curator, uh, who who need data curation skills and services, but that's just not in the cards. So are there are there ways that we can provide with our additional capacity, uh, because we're not at capacity currently, um, are there ways that we can provide that end service to those institutions? The question then, of course, has to come back to the curators. Because I think the curators never started this job to be in the business of making curation happen for anybody who has a dollar. So how do we ensure that we are really kind of protecting our vision and protecting our mission by expanding and broadening? And this has been a really interesting challenge for us because we really have to sort of question our, our sustainability motivations. Are we doing this just so we can make sure that our data are well curated? Or are we doing this to make sure all data are well curated? It's going to be a different answer from each individual. And, and so that as a community, I think, has, has been really exciting to explore. And, and it just opens up uh, a lot of really uh, deep conversations, frankly, about what do we want our profession to be. And, and that kind of leads into this what's next question. And these are just some of the things that we've been mulling around and that have been coming back to us uh, that I, I would present to you uh, to think about as well. Um, that first one is advocacy, and I've sort of mentioned this throughout my, my talk, uh, that we, we want to be advocates for why data curation is important, um, but also advocates for that data curator role, and, and to never forget the people behind this process, because they are uh, you know, really there for a purpose, and, and if we don't continue to understand that purpose and to encourage you know, all of those <laughs> carrots and incentives, uh, we, we might just not have a, a program at all. Um, the other question is around consultancy. Uh, we have an expertise network for curating data types. We also have expertise in other things. We have expertise in setting up data repositories for a variety of uh, techni technical solutions. Is that something we would want to maybe go do site visits to work on You know how you can get this workflow to work for you or how to make JIRA work the way you want it. Um, so it's, it's really you know, possible to expand out some of the roles that we might play, um, but again, thinking about those motivations. Domain repositories came up earlier today. It's a really important, uh, I think, question about how we are curating data because the homogeneity of data curation happening within our domain repositories is different from general data repositories. So in terms of partnership, we need to ensure that the incentives are there on both sides. Um, and, and so I, I think this is, this is important because of that uh, give and take model that at least the Data Curation Network has been exploring. So if we're only um, you know, curating data sets from a domain repository that they don't have the local expertise for, it, it creates like a different set of expectations uh, from, from the rest of the Data Curation Network partners. Uh, so that's something we really want to, to test out with, with various domain repositories to see where that reciprocity might, might appear. And then are we, are, can we also just be a professional data curation community? Um, and, and I think this, this question really comes out of uh, the institutions that approached the data curation network and said, you know, we're also doing data curation. Um, we don't think we, we want to you know, participate in terms of curating your data, but maybe we could just hang out sometimes and talk about things. You know, that, that role of bringing together the community to establish standards or just being more informal in sharing knowledge. And, and is that our role to play? Is that somebody else's role to play? We're not quite sure yet. Um, we are also obviously very happy to work with you uh, in any way or shape that you see uh, could be useful. Um, we are not uh, just, we don't want to be the Data Curation Network with a capital T. Um, we are a Data Curation Network and, and we're trying our best to figure it out and we would love to, to share, you know, obviously what we've been going through but also um, learn from you and, and continue to uh, partner. So I have no idea if that worked in terms of time, but... Yep, that's good. Good. Yeah. Well, that's all we got. So Lisa, she wants to spot you with the question. Here we go. How do we show the value and return on investment of curating research data? <laughs> um, 
Exactly. <laughs> so I mentioned uh, a couple ideas, um, and maybe I'll go into detail about one more. Um, so when we look at a well curated data repository, I think those of us who've been doing this for a while, we can spot the differences. Um, we can really kind of see this data set has appropriate documentation. This data set does appear to have you know, enough contextual information to relate it to the larger body of work. Uh, we can also see when a data set does not have some of those things, where it appears to be a conundrum, just doesn't seem to have enough information to actually reuse it. Um, so one of the ideas we have is to actually test out this with um, real researchers in, in terms of like a hackathon type event where we present them with various data sets and, and hopefully data sets from their own domain and their own field uh, and, and ask them about the reusability of these data sets and be able to test it with real people. Um, this idea was used uh, for reproducibility. Uh, Lisa Federer at the um, NIH, the National Library for Medicine actually, uh, did this for a reproducibility hackathon to test can you reproduce this data. Uh, so similarly for, for you know, data curation, we can maybe test out the value of curation in sort of an experimental laboratory setting like that. Um, otherwise, you know, that return on investment piece is the long-term long question. Um, if, if we really look at a data set value over time, uh, I think it would be hard to predict. Is, is this going to be of use? Is all the time and effort and work we put into it today going to actually pay out in the long run? Maybe this person becomes a Nobel Prize winner and this is the best data set ever, or maybe they don't. So we really have a lot of um, things to learn and, and I'm really interested in, in trying to explore that question uh, it, with all of you because there's I don't think there's a good answer. Uh, is my supervisor going to be okay with me working on messy data sets from institutions that are not my home institution? Great, great, great question. Um, not without a really good understanding of what we're trying to do. So one of the big steps in our sustainability process is to come up with a, a memorandum of understanding or some sort of agreement that we all as, as data curation network institutions can sign and, and that includes the supervisor, but maybe also the dean or the director, that we are agreeing to do this as a partner. So this is not just a fly by the night, you just do this on your spare time or when you go home type of thing. This should be part of your job and, and you should get credit for it. So, so by, by really paying attention, I think, to those incentives that are already existing for our data curators, we are gonna build that in to those, those agreements across the institutions. Right now, we're held together uh, by grant obligations. So we all have you know, time and effort being tracked on this, and it has to be tracked and, and accounted for, and everybody gets credit for that. What happens when the grant is no longer there? So that's a huge, huge issue, and, and we, we have to ensure that it, it, your supervisor will not get mad. Because the data says we'll be messy and we'll take a long time. In a similar vein, I think you um, pointed to this expectation that you have the equitability of people's work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Perhaps there's a really encouraging expert in our field that's very popular right now. Look at all of our grants, mm -hmm. whereas somebody else is going to sell in some area of disciplinary product. Right? Yeah. Well, they were sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Absolutely. And yet, both institutions are paying the same amount to be part of this mm -hmm. network. How do you ensure that the workload is, is as equitable? So how do you ensure that the workload across the institutions is fair? And, and that's exactly what we're doing right now by tracking the time put in. And, and that's why I think for our ultimate model that we roll out post-grant, it needs to include that recognition of the time commitment comes off the top of whatever membership fee there might be, if that's the model we choose. Um, but I don't think you can always account for it. Um, I, right now we have a lot of social science data curator expertise. But social science da data might not be coming to the repository that we present. It might be going to ICPSR or another data repository, which is great. So I think we will always see those imbalances. Um, and what we need to do is really be cognizant of them and aware of them and, and ensure that you know, we make other opportunities for people to contribute in different ways. Um, you know, there's a number of subgroups I didn't go into that our curators are also working on. So they could be doing research in different areas or exploring interest groups like, like what we have here uh, around you know, different data topics. 
Another question. Um, strategies for librarians working in institutions where admin have no interest in data management. Huh. Um, one of the activities, we didn't do it today, but we typically do in our workshops, is a elevator speech activity, where we, we ask everybody in the room to think about that person, um, whether it's the, uh, the AVP, the dean, cranky researcher, whomever, think about that conversation they need to have, and, and come up with your, your elevator speech. Tell them why data creation is important. And, and I think it's a really important exercise for us each to go through because there's this, this topic of data creation is maybe conflated or confused or you know, meshed with other types of similar topics. So it is kind of hard. We all think of something different when we talk about data creation. Um, and so coming up with that clear elevator speech is, is really important. Um, and, and the broader data management issue, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's a challenge, you know? There's a lot of questions, I think, in our field about what we're doing, but um, essentially I always fall back on uh, the fact that our library, at least that's where I'm working on in the library context, um, is the, the, the leader on our campus in these topics. And because of that, we're having conversations campus-wide. Because of that, we have a data management policy. And so if we hadn't have started those conversations and been at that table, I really don't think we would have where we are today. Just a uh, suggestion on that one, I would say do it anyway. Do it directly with the researcher. And maybe if it's a candidate research chair or a researcher that has a kind of profile, then show a value to your admins by doing it and allowing the researcher to also back up the value prop. That's a great advice. Do it anyway. Oh, yeah. How are you tracking the impact and use of the curated data sets? Hmm. So, um, tracking impact and reuse of data is very hard. Uh, we can see the number of downloads. Are those people downloads? Are those machine downloads? Those are questions I have. Um, we can see perhaps the citation of the data, if it is appropriately cited. Sometimes data are just mentioned in the methods section. Um, so there are a number of competing issues here with trying to track the impact and the reuse of curated data sets. Uh, right now in the Data Creation Network, we have not found a solution for that particular problem. We are tracking a lot of metrics. We're tracking how much time goes into the curation process. Uh, we're tracking even you know, all of the statistics about the, how, how the, the curation work happens. <laughs> but once it gets released out into the wild, uh, that's where it becomes much more difficult, and we're looking across the local institutions that we all do it differently. So it would even be hard to compare uh, across our local repositories. So we don't have a good answer. <laughs> I don't have an answer. Does anybody? Yeah? I believe ICPSR does some right. tracking, and they've got the horsepower to do that, but they, they actually have people go in and yeah brute force and maybe through mm -hmm. some scripts and bots and such yeah. to search for ICPSR data in the literature system and bring that back and incorporate it into a, an online bibliography. Undergraduate students also helpful in that area. Especially if you get some undergrad batch to see the plan in place to get your feet into then talking to people that are putting the time into it. Mm -hmm. Right. So we definitely having that plan in place. Yep. Is so important. Yeah, I think there are a lot of really great projects to do having make data count um, is one example, and um, having drawer statistics attached to the repository kind of ways. Yeah. I do have a statistic that I have for you. I have heard recently that um, articles that are published in the data sets mm -hmm. accompanying them are cited 25% more than articles that don't have data sets. Oh, great. Right. So tell us that's what you're able to count, but at yeah. least the data that yeah. Do you know like impacts on the data itself? Um, are you noticing like changes in uh, like usage behavior? Um, yeah. So like a person that can talk to buy all the things for a truthful moment, mm -hmm. truthful moment. Do you notice improvements in the individual situation? Absolutely. Yeah. Do we notice improvements with research behavior? Um, yes. That's the most exciting 
part of my day really is it's when I get a, a repeat customer, a return submitter, and the data is so much better and they are using our readme file template and it's just a very simple process. It really does make a difference. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think when we're doing the curation steps, it, it, it's it's a form of that hands-on, you know, opportunity to engage with that workshop of one uh, around how to create a good data set. Yeah. More? Okay. <laughs> Ideally, how much curatorial effort should the researcher put in before the package comes to the into the repository's team? I see bottlenecks. Um, there are lots of bottlenecks uh, and. Curatorial effort, ideally, ideally uh, there there would be uh, an amazing uh, process to collect the data in such a way that all of our answers would be addressed right there initially. Um, that's not usually going to happen, though. Um, so I actually wanted to refer back to uh, the, the article that was mentioned earlier in the Scully Kitchen uh, that Roger wrote around this this. Dichotomy of uh, we, we have this publisher uh, policies to share the data, and and then we we have this broader need of researchers <coughs> being needed, needing to access the actual data that is produced by the community, and so I think this this question should be seen in that context because I think a lot of my researchers are coming to us for that first problem. They want to publish their data because they're being told to by their journal. So not a lot of effort has gone into it um, because they're just meeting a policy, they're meeting a mandate. And, and in fact, I don't know how much effort we want to put into it sometimes because it's just a subset of the really important data that exists somewhere else. Um, it's just the data behind their graphs. And for reproducibility purposes, obviously, yes, this is great, great news. But there is a bigger issue at stake that you know, the rest of that data is, is not interoperable with the other data produced by that community. So we're piecemealing it. We're cutting it up into tiny bits and we're just kind of pulling it out from everywhere, including into my repository. So how, how do we address this, this larger question of um, not, maybe not packaging them up so small and so tight and, and thinking about that process you know, from beginning to end? I don't think it's as easy, though, as just saying we should do that. Um, I work on data management plans all the time. Uh, just this week, we worked on a data management plan where the group wants to create a potato data repository. <laughs> There's a lot of great research going on in potatoes, right? Um, it's, it's about the genomics, it's about the agricultural, the soil samples, it's all really, you know, very dispersed, different types of data. Bringing those all together is a huge challenge. Um, now, do we want to see that spread across all the different repositories out there, or wouldn't it be great to bring it all together into one community? Uh, and, and even just starting that question of, well, how are you actually going to build this data repository was, you know, it's a difficult question. It's kind of, kind of buried in the grant proposal somewhere. I mean, the, their focus is on the research. So um, how much care throw effort? Well, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it's just, it, it is something that we, we each need to um, talk more about the process of curation, not as a means to an end not as meeting your grant, not as meeting your funder requirements, not as meeting your journal requirements, but thinking about how can we make this data reusable overall um, and uh, think about how we do this differently and not let the scholarly communication system sort of uh, take over data publishing uh, as well. Okay, that's it. Oh, good. I get to go down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic. And yeah, thank you for the barrage of questions. Mentimeter is fantastic. I just keep up question after question. Uh, so that was a really great presentation, and I think the experience of the Data Curation Network is something that we all can reflect on as we continue to have these conversations over the next two days. Um, it's been a long day. Uh, but we do want to have one more activity uh, before we let you go. Um, so this is sort of a wrap-up discussion, 30-minute lightning round. So if you look on your name tags and you look in the back, you have a mysterious number uh, that I'll now explain. Uh, so that number uh, refers to your group. Um, so um, we're going to uh, get together with our groups uh, and find a space for your discussion. So groups one, two, three, and four are here. Uh, and groups five and six are downstairs in 111. Um, so in groups, you'll be asked to respond to two questions. 
um, presented in our shared Google Doc found here in this Bitly link. Um, the Bitly link is also written downstairs on the whiteboard uh, so you can access it. Uh, each group will have a facilitator from the program um, committee. Uh, so that facilitator will be responsible for kind of guiding the discussion and also doing some note taking uh, to capture the responses on the Google Docs. Um, and so the two questions are as follows. Uh, so one, what are the main barriers or challenges to data curation activities within your organization and in your work? And two, what are the key elements of a national approach that address these barriers and challenges? They're big questions, it's been a long day, but it's just sort of um, a good chance to, to get you started thinking about it. And we're going to be exploring these in greater depth tomorrow.